college theme presentation of the year. You've probably seen two, you're going to see two after me, at least I hope. Um, for those of you who might not know me, my name is Bridget Loftus, I'm the chemistry instructor here at Spoon. If you take a chem class, I'm who you get. I teach all of them. Online, face-to-face, -face, all of them come through me. So, my presentation today is trying to convince you why every single one of you who are not currently in a chemistry class or have not taken a chemistry class, why you all should take a chemistry class before you leave college in some way, shape, or form. So, um, before I start my presentation, I'm throwing back to one of my colleagues' presentations from home. Mr. Maher started his college theme presentation asking the students a question. So I'm going to pose you the same question. It's not a hard question. It's also not a rhetorical question. I would actually like an answer. Why are you here? And I'm please, I don't mean in this room, I don't need to know how many of you are here just for extra credit. <laughs> it's an accepted fact. Um, why are you in college? Oh. Yes? To pursue my um, career in mass communications. Okay, good, career, right? Every one of you thought it, nobody wanted to say it. You are all here, most of you, to get a job, right? Either a better job or a job that pays more. Anybody else want to throw another reason out there why you are in college? You're just all going to stare at me on this Monday morning. Yeah. To further your education. To further your education. Great. Perfect. Thank you for audience participation. Um, those are all valid, respected, and, and common answers. Um, what I heard yesterday that I really liked was to set an example, which was a great um, answer. I heard another student say to become a better person, which is great. Okay. And very good. So. I'm going to approach this from kind of those three pronged approach. Why you should take a chemistry class. I could stand up here and give you radio commercial um, list of why you should take a chemistry class, and I could probably fill the whole 20 minutes with a numbered list of list of reasons. But I'm going to focus on three areas: employability, right? You want to get a job of some kind. Um, if you don't know what chemistry is, it is literally the study of what you are made of, what you interact with and what surrounds you all day, every day. So, also, really good reason to take a chemistry class. And then, do you get a better understanding of science, okay, in general. So, employability. Um, I, if you come to the first college theme presentation on this campus, I know you've heard of this term. My other colleague, Douglas Oki, threw this term out there, okay. Soft skills, how many of you have heard the term soft skills? Okay, couple great hands. Many of you may have heard it, thank you. Okay. Soft skills are generally um, personal attributes that enable someone to interact effectively and harmoniously with other people. They are your people skills. They are your life skills. These are the skills that apply to your life regardless of what job you go into. You need these skills. These are also the skills that your employers won't train you to do, which is why you learn them in college. So from chemistry, you get a wide variety of these soft skills. Um, big and foremost, critical thinking, okay? The one thing you do all the time in a chemistry class is problem solve. Every single day you solve problems in some way, shape, or form. Right. Um, at some point, you are going to ask a question. Whether it's to your instructor, or to a classmate, or to a tutor, or to the internet, or whoever you're asking a question to, that's a valuable skill learning how to ask a question or to ask for help, okay? It's a skill that, personally, um, I work on every time, okay? Asking questions is very difficult. I don't like it. I'd rather find the answer myself. But you will learn that in a chemistry class, okay? Chemistry is not easy. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and tell you that it is. It is not an easy class. And some of you will learn how to struggle, which is also a very valuable skill. At some point in your life, you're coming across something that's not going to go as planned, Okay? How you react to that is the important part. How you react to not doing well on a test that you thought you were going to do well on, that's a skill that's going to serve you well in the long run. Okay? If you graduate college and you have never struggled in a single class, I'm going out on a limb and saying you took the wrong classes. Okay? My organic chemistry teacher in college used to say an employer would rather see you get a C in organic chemistry than an A in underwater basket weaving. That's the true thing he said, okay? So sometimes you have to learn how to struggle. Also organization, okay, one of my favorite student evaluations I ever got was a student told me that my chemistry class had helped prepare her to be organized for nursing school, which is fantastic, perfect. 
you got something that is a life skill out of this class. Okay. So, if I haven't convinced you on that front, you, okay, you do chemistry every single day. All day, every day. Your body is a running chemical reaction. Okay? And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna convince you. Alright? In this room, all of you at some point eat and drink something. Chemical reactions every time. Your body breaks down food to get energy. It's a biology principle that is dictated by chemistry, which a lot of bio most biology principles are. Uh, you breathe, okay, you wash your hands, wash your clothes, that's all chemistry. Uh, you cook. I cannot give you a better outside of class example than cooking. That is by definition chemical reaction. Okay? You are changing the chemical composition of food so your body can digest it properly. All right? That is chemistry every single day. Uh, if you take any sort of medication, over-the-counter uh, prescription was made by chemistry, was purified by chemistry, when you take it, runs chemical reactions in your body every time. We don't get to talk about all of these good fun things in intro chemistry classes because you know you gotta learn the basics before you can run. But you do touch on all of these things. Okay. Um, other reasons to take chemistry classes that involve your life. Household chemicals. You all have them. Whether you call them chemicals or not, they are. Okay, I hate to burst that bubble too. Everything you ingest is a chemical. Um, I always have to laugh when I hear someone say that they want to live a chemical-free life. Not a thing. You can't do it. Sorry, not happening. Okay, this is, hey, hey, there it goes. All right, and you may not come up with two answers that I'm expecting, but that's okay. Um, anyone want to guess which two general household chemicals that I'm guessing most of you have in your house you should never mix together? Bleach and literally anything else. Yes! Bleach and literally anything else, but what's the main anything else? <laughs> ammonia. Bleach and ammonia. And this involves anything that includes bleach. So, most of your household cleaners. When you mix bleach and ammonia together, I'm not going to get into the details here, they mix main, three main compounds. All of them are nitrogen based. Okay. Um, nitrogen compounds inherently attack um, soft tissue membranes, so they irritate your eyes, they irritate the soft lining in your nose, um, they irritate your lungs if you breathe them in. All three of the chemicals that are produced in this compound are toxic in high chemical reactions. Okay. This is a thing that people do. Because bleach cleans and ammonia cleans, and if they mix them together, it makes a super cleaner. No. That's not how, no. Okay. Pro tip, don't mix bleach with anything, except water, and preferably cool water. Don't, don't do the hot water, don't heat bleach, don't mix it with anything else. It's just all on its own. If bleach isn't fixing your problem, go somewhere else, but don't mix it with anything. Okay. It's one of my favorite things to talk about, because people are like, oh. I'm glad that people knew that, so that was, that's a happy day for me. <laughs> Happy day for me. All right, the last thing, reason you should take a chemistry class, and this is where I have a hard time making an argument for taking a chemistry class without also making an argument for biology and microbiology and uh, physics and math and all of these other classes that feed into the liberal arts. So we're gonna blend out of chemistry just a little bit, okay? If you don't think you need a basic understanding of science right now, you are not paying attention. And I beg you to start paying attention, okay? There are so many things that can be better understood with just the basics of science. Because I'm me and I will never not give a college theme presentation without talking about it, vaccines are one of them. I've given three college theme presentations, every single one I talk about vaccines because it is that important to talk about vaccines, okay? Um, Antibiotic use is one I haven't talked about before, but you could probably give an entire series of college theme presentations on the proper use of antibiotics and what happens when you don't use them properly. Uh, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, super important for the farmers okay, and consumers of farm products. Uh, climate change, don't even get me started. I'm not getting on that train. There are people smarter than me who could talk about it, but it's a thing, it's happening. The world is literally on fire. So, FYI. Um, the word natural, I hate that word. If you know anything about me, you know I hate that word. That word has been corrupted by the food industry to mean something that it does not actually mean. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about that one either because it also makes me agitated. Um, and then scientific studies. I like this one, it's one I haven't talked about before. Um, but if you watch 
like the news or you read the internet and every other day there's research shows something new and research shows coffee is good for your heart but then the next day coffee is bad for your heart but then it's just the right amount of coffee is not going to kill you so there are things to watch for in these scientific studies so i'm going to touch on vaccines antibiotics and the studies component the others i will let you do your own research on so again i'm me i'm going to talk about it okay if you did not know there has been a measles outbreak in the united states for close to a year okay um, and I say close to because the initial outbreak started on October 1st of 2018 in New York. Okay. Today is October 2nd of 2019. I believe, and please don't quote me on the date because I did not refresh my memory before I came over here since I was running late. Um, I believe that measles outbreak was considered done uh, last week. So not by a whole lot. Uh, the United States um, eliminated the measles in 2000. The World Health Organization basically says if the disease is not spreading for a year with a monitored system of surveillance, um, you can declare the disease eliminated. I believe the United Kingdom lost their elimination status this year, along with several other European countries lost their measles elimination status this year because people are not getting measles vaccines because some person, shall we say, published a bogus paper that said that the MMR vaccine caused autism does not. It was Andrew Wakefield. Yes, it was. it was. Yes, that is his name. That is the person, shall we say. Uh, just FYI, by the way, he was a practicing doctor. He lost his medical license over this paper because he lied about it. He draw in his, his study was designed poorly. He had conflicts of interest he never disclosed, and he ended up losing his medical license because of it. He's still sticking around. He's in Texas right now, I believe, causing problems. Um, <laughs> But part of the reason that this has started to spread more is because this idea that the MMR vaccine causes autism. Okay, um, okay also, flu shot season. Hey, hey, get your flu shots. This month, sooner the better. Okay, if you haven't done it yet, go to Walgreens or CVS, your local drugstore, get a flu shot. Doesn't hurt, I promise. Does not give you the flu. Also, not a thing that actually happens. Um, the virus in the flu shot is dead. Now, that is the shot. There is also a nasal spray that um, they use for flu vaccinations. I'm unsure on the status of that one. So that's a conversation you have with your doctor if you're concerned. But I know that the flu shot is a dead vaccine. Get your flu shots, okay? Also, not about you, okay? True confession time, I didn't get a flu shot. My first flu shot was at the age of 28. So I went my entire life, essentially, well, a quarter of my life, without getting a flu shot. Not because I didn't believe in it, just because it was one more thing to do. And I was in college, and a young adult and I was healthy and everything was fine and I was like if I get the flu it's not the end of the world it's not about me and it's not about you it's about everybody else that can't get the flu shot the babies and the older people and the immunocompromised people who actually can't get the flu shot it's about protecting them okay so get your flu shots okay I convinced you of that maybe antibiotic resistance is real and it is absolutely terrifying if you did not know this was a thing, this is a thing. We are headed towards a time where our antibiotics are going to work less and less, and we are not discovering new antibiotics at a rate that we should, if at all. Um, so this is a thing. When the doctor prescribes you antibiotics, please, 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 please take the full dose, okay? If it's a seven to 10 day antibiotic pack, take the seven to 10 day antibiotics, okay? You're probably gonna start feeling better on like day four, Finish the antibiotics. If you don't finish the antibiotics, odds are you get sick again with bacteria that no longer respond potentially to that same antibiotic, and this then potentially leads to resistant bacteria that will no longer respond to that. And anybody, finish your antibiotics, okay? That's be one thing that you never actually have to like throw out is just finish the course of antibiotics. Antibiotics don't work for colds, flus, um, other viruses. Okay, don't, don't get an antibiotic for that. Don't call them. I, um, sometimes you feel sick and you're like, okay, this is strep throat, I want an antibiotic. So you call your doctor, you want an antibiotic? Is it strep throat? Did you get it tested? <laughs> Doctor's probably gonna wanna see you because they don't usually give you antibiotics in a phone call. Okay, uh, so finish your antibiotics and all of that good fun stuff. Okay, last one. 
oh, I'm doing better on time than I was yesterday. I talked to Maya a minute in my presentation yesterday, and I went the full 20 minutes. So, a little bit better on time today. Uh, scientific studies. So, things to watch for in a scientific study when you hear something on the news. I am a fan of news anchors and news people and the internet and all that good fun stuff. However, specifically on media, news, like on the TV, they're trying to fit a multi-paged scientific study into like 15 seconds of airtime. They don't get the chance to tell you the details that you really need to evaluate that study, okay? Um, so some things to watch for. If a study claims to like cure this disease that we have not had a cure for before, or if it claims that it's definitely going to do something, we're for sure going to do something, all of those definitive statements are very skeptical, okay? Good scientific studies are all about, it might do this, it could possibly do this, we need to do more research on this. Scientists are always about doing more research. We research things until forever. We just keep doing it, okay? Because you keep doing it until maybe you find something that's wrong and then you go, okay, move on to the next one. All right, so be careful how things are phrased. And if you're telling someone about a study, be careful how you phrase things, because words matter, okay? How you state something matters. Um, how was the study designed? This one's a little bit harder for like the general population to decide if it was designed well or not. Um, but it is something to consider and what they took into account when designing a study. Was it peer review? This one is huge in science. Peer review is everything when it comes to publishing a paper. Okay. Um, peer review means you've done the research, you've written the paper, you send it out to the scientific community, to people who actually fully understand what you've been doing. They get to read your paper, they get to look at how your study was designed, they're the ones that are going to figure that out if it was designed poorly. They're the ones that get to ask you questions on it, suggest edits, they get to check your work, essentially. It's like grading a test before it's graded, that's what they're doing. Okay? You get to then make edits and then potentially get it published. Most uh, legitimate journals, and I can't say all because I don't know for sure, but most legitimate journals require peer review before they will publish an article. So this is a really, really good step into trying to find the things that don't work well. Sometimes it's just an honest mistake. You thought that you had this results and really someone's like, um, I don't necessarily agree with you. And then you're like, oh, I was wrong. So then you admit you were wrong and you continue your research. Scientists are pretty good at that, by the way, admitting they were wrong and then changing their opinion. They're pretty good. Um, was it published in a quality journal? Um, journals all get what we call an impact factor. Um, it's basically a number that tells you how many citations occur for that journal on a regular basis. The more a journal is cited, the more respected it is. Because citations are also everything. That means other people are using your paper. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. Skipping a couple of these. Ooh, did somebody have to pay to get it published? Not a terrible thing, but not a great thing either. You have to pay someone to publish your paper. Maybe not. Uh, disclose conflicts of interest. Again, conflicts of interest don't necessarily make your research bad, but you should disclose them up front so everybody knows that, hey, you're getting paid by this big company to run this research. Doesn't mean you lied about it, doesn't mean you did anything wrong, but people should have that information before they accept your conclusions. Um, are you trying to say that something is weird? Like, if everybody says the sky is blue and then someone publishes a paper that's like, the sky is not blue, then you're like, something has gone very weird. Um, we all have our, like, you hear something and you just jump at it. Like, the FDA published a list not that long ago of 16 grain-free dog foods that could potentially cause heart disease in dogs, okay? I'm gonna admit on camera for, for everyone. I jumped at that one. I was like, oh my god, my dog is eating grain-free dog food. I gotta change your food immediately. And then I stopped. I was like, okay, wait, what was this actually saying? Um, and what the study was actually saying was that there is a potential link, again that word potential, maybe, possibly. The FDA by no means was saying stop feeding your dog this food, but they're like, hey, talk to your vet if you're concerned. So definitely jumped on that one way too soon, and then I was like, oh, okay, I did the thing that I'm not supposed to do. Everybody does it. We all have our, we all have our triggers where you're like, I'm gonna just believe this up because I want to. 